All right, thank you so very much, Professor. It's an absolute pleasure to sit with you today and talk to you and get your insights. My name is Erica Liss. I'm the founder of Peace Post and really eager to learn a little bit more about your insights pertaining to AI and how narcissism and AI relate together. So I'm gonna start off and basically ask you a little bit about how you really came to the conclusion of how AI and narcissists really relate. Well, First of all, thank you for having me. It's very courageous of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not uh, not to abuse this opportunity. So, <laughs> artificial intelligence and pathological narcissism are actually two forms of crowdsourcing. Mm. They use what may easily be described as large language models, at least the type of artificial intelligence which is commercially available, the retail type. Chat GPT and so on. More serious artificial intelligence works otherwise, doesn't utilize large, large language models, but does utilize databases and so on. Both narcissism or both narcissists and artificial intelligence programs, they're both hive minds. They're not individual in any sense. They represent the sum total, the agglomeration and the accretion of information or opinions or inputs or reactions or whatever uh, of many, many, many participants, sometimes too many to enumerate. The narcissist, for example, regulates his sense of self-worth and his sense of identity, such as it is, <laughs> by resorting to feedback from other people. He then amalgamates this feedback tries to impose on it a narrative which would render it somehow cohesive, and then on the fly, he proceeds to adopt this input as the contours of an identity. This process is known as narcissistic supply. Artificial intelligence basically does the same. Artificial, uh, when I say artificial intelligence, I want it to be clear. I'm referring to the kind of artificial intelligence which is public-facing, commercially available, retailized by the likes of Google and Facebook and ChatGPT and OpenAI and all these, I am not referring to much more serious artificial intelligence programs in use in scientific endeavors, in space exploration. I'm not referring to this. So there's a question of hive mind. Second thing, artificial intelligence, the retail version at least, places emphasis on impressing people. It's an impressions management software. For example, artificial intelligence programs such as uh, ChatGPT are not concerned with the truth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. They frequently hallucinate. They very frequently give the wrong answers, wrong information, and so on and so forth. And they're not concerned with it. It doesn't bother them. It doesn't worry these programs or the programmers. What uh, this kind of artificial intelligence is trying to do is to impress you with their linguistic capacity to pass off as human beings. In other words, to succeed in the Turing test. So it's an impressions management approach, which is a great way of encapsulating pathological narcissism. Narcissism is about impressions management. It's not about communi communicating. It's not about veracity. It's not about factuality. It's not about truthfulness. It's about impressing you, captivating you, acquiring you as a source of supply, an admirer, a fan, uh, whatever. Similarly, if you were to ask ChatGPT anything, you are quite likely to get the wrong answer, but it's going to be given to you in a way which would greatly impress you. This would sound a lot like a human being. That's the second element. The third element, of course, is the absence of empathy. Empathy has three components, reflexive, cognitive, and emotional affective. Both narcissists and artificial intelligence programs possess cognitive empathy. Artificial intelligence programs are programmed to pretend that they are empathic. Mm -hmm. 
Similarly, the narcissist pretends that he or she is empathic by using or leveraging cognitive empathy, what I call cold empathy. A narcissist abuse this capacity in order to spot your vulnerabilities and break through the chinks in your armor in order to somehow manipulate you to do their bidding. So do psychopaths. Mm -hmm. And so does, so do artificial intelligence programs. It's exactly what they do. They pretend to be empathetic. They pretend to be sensitive. They pretend to be politically correct. They pretend to be acutely aware of what is socially acceptable and what is not, what should be said and what should not, what is right and what is wrong, but it's all fake, of course. It's all a facade. There's no real empathy there because as far as we know, there are no emotions or effects, which are the only motivators for genuine empathy. These are only three of many, many, many facets of artificial intelligence and narcissism in common. The commonality is staggering. If you take into, uh, one last point before we both drop dead out of, of old age, <laughs> one last point. Um, everyone is ignoring the elephant in the room. And the elephant is in the room is the mental health profile of the people who come up with these inventions. Mm -hmm. For example, social media has been created by people who are, who are schizoids. People with schizoid, probably schizoid personality disorder. Other, other high-tech inventions and gadgets and devices were invented or created or imagined by narcissists, rank narcissists, such as Stephen Jobs. So the high-tech industry is the brainchild of mentally ill people. And, and I'm not saying mentally impaired or mentally challenged, mentally ill people. Narcissism is a severe mental illness. So is schizoid personality disorder. That's why it's called, it's called schizoid, because it's very close to schizophrenia. So these are mentally ill people who keep coming up with these new technologies. And to ignore the fact that this is the brainchild of mentally ill people is you know, counterproductive and self-defeating. Of course, we live in an age where everything is relative and it's only a question of differences, not a question of ill and healthy. You know, neurodivergent, you won't say mentally ill, it's neurodivergent and, mm -hmm. and all this kind of nonsense. But artificial intelligence, at least the public facing applications, bear the hallmarks of people who are not mentally well, I must say. Yeah, I think it's really important to at least acknowledge that the fact that this is a very vast technology that's getting into a lot of people's hands, and it absolutely is created to be as addictive as possible. So when we look at algorithms, they're meant to really create that, you know, wanting to pull the, the jackpot lever every single time. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that there are tools out there that are going to be here. And so is there a way to utilize those intelligently in a way that can be done ethically to help people? And so that's where I'm coming at this to try to solve. We've got a whole subset of individuals that are really lacking the self. And you've really touched on the point exactly where I was hoping we would go is they have the cognitive empathy where the cold empathy, where they can understand what sadness is. They can understand tears. They can understand. So you have the sentiment analysis, basically what the narcissist may do or someone devoid of a self, but they don't understand that. And that can be very similar to what AI does. So it has the sentiment analysis. It's able to understand like a written or verbal or um, any sort of communication. And then it extrapolates out. So in your, could you hypothesize a way that AI might be able to hyper focus or augment empathy in communication where you have someone that's basically devoid of true empathy in a communication style because 
at the end of the day, you have a narcissist that is either going to try to get supply. And so what are they trying to do? They're trying to elicit response. They're trying to manipulate. They're trying to do a lot of things. Could AI be utilized intelligently and responsibly to potentially help victims that are on the receiving end of that? AI is good in, uh, in pattern recognition. Mm -hmm much better than human beings are because of the infinite capacity of AI. AI models are capable of collaborating with each other. And there's no quantitative limitation on how many AI models work together. Mm -hmm. While the human brain is limited, there's the famous Dunbar number. We are limited to collaborating with 150 other people. Mm -hmm. When we exceed this number, our brain shuts down. Because AI models are capable of tapping the databases, information, language models of other AI applications and so on and so forth, it is possible to create a network of AI which would easily spot fake or feigned empathy, for example, via linguistic analysis. Mm -hmm. And yes, this kind of AI could alert the user that on the other end, there is someone who is faking it, someone mm -hmm. who is feigning it, someone who is uh, not genuine, someone who is, who is you know, manipulative. Machiavellianism, for example, is easily spotable, actually, even without AI. We have very powerful tests, and they assign what is known as a Mach number, Machiavellianism number. <laughs> and this is a very rigorous and, and highly validated and, and can be easily administered by people. Now, an AI interface could administer a Machiavellianism test whenever approached, whenever used. We could even we could even agree or decide that AI would administer a battery of psychological tests to any user prior and would create a psychological profile, a psych profile of the user. We, and that would be a precondition for using the technology. Um, and then exactly like on a dating service, you would have the psych profile of the user. And some people would be thrilled to interact with narcissists and psychopaths. It's not that narcissists and psychopaths would become immediately outcasts and pariahs and no one would talk to them. It's on the very contrary. I mean, there are people who are or elated to correspond and fall in love with serial killers. It takes all kinds. But informed decision-making is the key. If you know what you're getting into, then that's where the technology stops and adulthood begins. Responsibility and accountability. The problem right now is that sophisticated users of computer technologies, and it's not limited to artificial intelligence, for example, social media, Mm -hmm. sophisticated users can pretend to be anyone they want. And it is extremely easy to mislead people because the vast majority of people are dumb and gullible. This is known as the base rate fallacy. People believe between 90 to 95% of the statements they come across without bothering to check, without exercising critical thinking, if they are at all capable of exercising critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, everything I'm saying is, of course, politically incorrect, and it's not because I'm trying to impress you or the viewers, because this is what I really believe. I believe I hold a very dim view of technological empowerment of the masses. Very dim view. Mm -hmm. I think we have given babes in the wood, we have give, given them weapons, guns. The modern technology is a very powerful weapon, and we've given it to people without training them, without qualifying them, without selecting them, without nothing. It's available in the wild, and it's exactly like a virus. When there's a new virus, new, totally new, the population is susceptible. It has no immune response. And then the virus kills millions of people. Modern technology is such a virus, mm -hmm. and it has been unleashed upon the unsuspecting and the susceptible. And we are adding to that, we are adding crime to injury, and that is artificial intelligence. In short, unlike you, I don't believe that the solution is 
maybe trying to protect the masses or maybe trying to, but I think the solution is denying access to these technologies altogether mm -hmm. until we have implemented the kind of education and training that would qualify people to use these technologies, maybe through a process of licensing, maybe. I mean, you need a license to have a gun. Why don't you need a license to use artificial intelligence? So social uh, media, for example, is a, is a great case in point. Social media was released to the, to the masses, to the public, without any warning or preparation or training or qualification or education or anything. It's just released. Mm -hmm. The outcomes are beyond disastrous. Beyond disastrous. Twenge and Campbell, for example, in their studies have demonstrated that social media specifically has caused a quintupling of depression rates and a tripling of anxiety rates among teenagers and a massive rise in suicides among teenagers. And that was 2018. The situation now is much worse. We see, of course, extremism. We see fake news. We see misinformation. We see radicalism. We see violence. We see aggression. We see uh, incitement to murder, for example, in insult communities among you know, fundamentalist Muslims online and so on. The web, the social media has been weaponized completely by people, even, even normal, even healthy people, even, even, you know, your next door neighbor. I'm not talking about a fundamentalist in Afghanistan or Iraq. Mm -hmm. Everyone is, is now weaponizing social media. The level of aggression and hatred and negative effects such as envy and so on on social media, have, they have skyrocketed and have hijacked the applications. Today, you cannot use social media without being exposed to hatred, aggression, often directed at you for no reason whatsoever, without being exposed to crazies and crazy making, without being exposed to haters and, and hate mongering. There's no way to use these applications safely. They are unsafe. They're unsafe. Why is that? Because everyone was given access. I can completely understand a lot of the hesitations that you're facing with that. And especially it's readily available. Apple just deployed their 18, um, their latest version, I think 18. Yeah, they haven't yet, but they're about to in a week or two. Yeah. yeah so in the States, they have their Apple AI built right in. So yeah. that basically becomes mass deployment yeah. across all Apple users in the States for those people that upgrade their operating system. So it def definitely becomes, you know, something that becomes readily available to even people that may not have, you know, been familiar with some of the large language models, but it's now on their phones. And so you know, this is a very big ship to steer, and I completely understand a lot of the hesitations. And I mean, I watched some of your other videos concerning, you know, basically some of the dangers that can come about this. And at the end of the day, you know, some of these technology leaders, it, it is getting implemented into everyday usage. And so I don't know. I don't understand, I don't understand one thing. Mm -hmm. There is a machine, a device, it costs a few hundred bucks. It allows you to edit genes. Mm -hmm. To edit genes, to create new animals, new interesting animals, fun animals, you know, or to introduce genes from one animal to another animal, or from animals to plants, or and to, you know, play around in your basement and have great fun. And yet, it is forbidden to sell this machine to, to people who are not qualified. Actually, only universities purchase these machines. These are CRISPR machines. That's the correct way to go about it. Why is it that when it comes to biotechnology, we are really, really careful and responsible adults? We do not allow people to clone organisms, although this can be done in your living room nowadays. We do not allow them to sequ sequence genomes, although this can be done in your toilet nowadays. <laughs> They're tiny machines that, you know, do everything nowadays, within minutes. Yet we don't allow people access to these technologies. Absolutely not. Similarly, when it comes to weapons, with the exception of the United States in the civilized world, we don't allow people access to guns. 
Definitely we don't allow them to 3D print guns. We don't allow them to have ghost guns. You know, we just don't allow it. The fact that the technology exists does not automatically imply the right to use it. Definitely not the mass right to use it. Mm -hmm. And yet the only exception is the most powerful technology of them all. Far more dangerous than nuclear energy. And that is artificial intelligence and the internet. And It's not clear to me why this technology should be singled out for universal access. When this is the technology of the intellect. Mm -hmm. If you have a gun, you can kill one person, four on average, and mass killing is four. But you, if you have access to specific internet technologies, you can kill millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands. It's, it's not clear to me why this discrimination. And probably the only reason is money. There's a lot of money in it. It's the only reason. I think there is definitely a, a giant push with data. And so understanding and trying as individuals, we do the best that we can to minimize sending out personal data and all of that, because the, it, it can be a very powerful tool like I, I in weapon, if you want to go that far, because I don't want to diminish what you're saying, because everything that you're saying is true the fact that at the end of the day it has the potential to manipulate images it had it can tell stories it can tell a whole whole pictures that may not exist and so it is in the wild it is one of those things where we can't you know, basically put it back, get the cat back in the bag. The, the question becomes, it's there. Is there a way to utilize it for the betterment of humanity? And that was one of the things that I've been pondering tremendously because I noticed a potential with at least sentiment analysis I noticed a challenge when you had individuals that struggled, whether they were in trauma bonds or in struggling in situations in which they were unable to break free of the love or the situation, or they were forced to communicate with someone that's potentially toxic. And is there a way to utilize, like from a communication standpoint, you know, you'd recommend no contact best, easiest way to deal with that toxic person because at the end of the day, you're going to get manipulated. You're forced to communicate with them. How can you do it? So I was trying to solve that with creating a application that would do sentiment analysis that would help educate people on the process with gray rock methodology to basically shut down future communication to stop basically the the snowball effect where it will just turn into a giant avalanche where the conversation everything kind of goes sideways and so ai unfortunately or fortunately however you look at it is here are there intelligent ways to apply this that can potentially help people and at the end of the day that's how I'm trying to utilize it for the betterment of humanity. As I said, AI would be good at analyzing especially linguistic patterns. Mm -hmm. And it is through language that we can detect narcissists and psychopaths with high reliability and high validity very early on. Mm -hmm. And so AI could be could provide alerts or be a kind of sensor which would inform you early on that you're faced with a narcissist or a psychopath and could give you then full information about what, what, what is a narcissist, narcissistic behaviors, signs to look for, counter behaviors, your reactions, how to tailor the relationship or how to avoid the relationship altogether and so on and so forth. So AI can do, can do both. It could detect the person facing you 
early on, and then it can provide you with all the information you need, including tips and advice and, and tailor or customize your behavior according to the specific circumstances that you, that you describe and so on and so forth. It could be, in short, it could be a kind of guide uh, by your side. It could be. So I guess the question I have for you is, in general, how do you view toxic, manipulative individuals? How do they respond to the gray rock method and basically being shut down in, in, in general communication? Well, it depends. Narcissists would usually lose interest if you mm -hmm. demonstrate your your lack of potential as a source of narcissistic supply, the narcissist walks away. Narcissists are focused on on one goal and one goal only, and that is to secure a regular, predictable, uninterrupted flow of attention that helps them to regulate their internal environment. If there are disruptions in the flow of attention, regardless of the reason, by the way, it doesn't have to be gray rock, if there are any disruptions in the flow of attention, they lose interest in the source of the supply. So, for example, if you're sick, if you happen to be sick, and because you're sick, you're, you're unavailable, mm -hmm. or you're in a hospital, and so therefore you cannot... So they would lose interest in you within days, even if you have spent 20 years together. Mm -hmm. They would lose interest in you. Your utility, your value rests exclusively on your ability to provide not only supply but also services sex and um safety your, mm -hmm. your very presence i call these the four s's so if you provide two of the four s's you're still valuable if you provide three you're very valuable mm -hmm. if you provide four you're a unicorn you're amazing <laughs> but two, two would do, two, two are enough. So any disruption and interruption to this flow render you useless. Immediately, immediately the narcissist devalues and discards you in his mind and moves on to the next potential source of supply. Mm -hmm. starts to cultivate alternatives and so on. So gray rock is a very powerful technique, very powerful technique. The problem is, of course, not so much in what to do once you have identified a narcissist. There is a, there are quite a few techniques. Gray rock is only one of them. Mm -hmm. There is about eight techniques which are equally as powerful as gray rock. But the problem is to identify a narcissist mm -hmm. and to identify, even more so, to identify a psychopath. Psychopath, mm -hmm. psychopaths act. The great actors. Mm -hmm. And narcissists uh, believe their own confabulations and fantasies and stories and promises. And so because narcissists believe what they're saying, it's very difficult to spot them. It appears to be real and genuine and authentic. And because psychopaths are goal-oriented, highly manipulative, and very good at, at modifying other people's behaviors and expectations, psychopaths are also undetectable. I think AI's main contribution would be detection, actually. Detection rather than, I mean, also maybe provide all kinds of techniques and so on, but the detection would be important. Yeah, I think detection definitely has promise. I think we're some ways away from that without having true human insight and oversight into a lot of these things, because you can even have true therapists that have been doing this for years get fooled. So if we're going to have an unmitigated machine that's going to be looking at, you know, written communication as the only baseline to diagnose somebody, somebody, I think that becomes very dangerous and a slippery slope because, you know, you can look at all the studies where, you know, they drop people off at of Stanford and then they get uh, diagnosed with, you know, all kinds of uh, diagnosis that didn't exist. I think you're, and you alluded to it earlier, like, AI can be susceptible to biases. It can have hallucinations. It can, you know, and, and that's why there needs to be responsible implementation of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a one size fits all. And you can't just basically <laughs> swing a hammer and say, we're going to solve everything with this. So, but if we can start to take chunks of this, and I think through your decades of research, 
you know, you're starting to piece together like techniques to understand, help victims get to a place where they are able to identify, solve, and move forward from that. And so if we can, I think, take little slivers of this and start to, you know, how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. If we can start to do that with just communication, I think there's tremendous potential, at least from a altruistic perspective, hopefully, um, in putting this technology to good use. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the next question I have is, you know, you did mention, you know, using AI to identify these things, but then our individuals, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but if we were to hypothesize, if narcissists or these cluster B personalities have typical um, tracks or patterns in which they follow, is it possible we can start to identify where somebody is within the cycle? Like, are they going to be in the, you know, love bombing stage or are they in any, uh, any other stage? So I'd love your insights there. The reason many diagnosticians and clinicians fail to uh, properly identify narcissists and psychopaths is because they pay attention to too much information. Mm, interesting. They, they pay attention to body language. They pay attention to words. They pay attention to expressions and micro expressions. They pay attention to context. They pay attention to family members. They pay attention to the literature. They pay attention to videos by Sandvaknin, maybe. <laughs> and so on. That's too much information. I think AI could be laser focused. And if I had to select a single thing which has excellent predictive value and high validity when it comes to diagnosing narcissists and psychopaths, it would be language. I think we could pretty easily actually design a Turing test for psychopaths and narcissists. The same way there's a Turing test for computers. Computers mislead you into believing that they're human beings by passing the Turing test. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what narcissists and psychopaths do. They mislead you into believing that they're human beings by imitating, emulating, mimicry, mm -hmm. pretending to be human beings. But psychopaths and narcissists are not human beings mm -hmm. because they miss critical modules, which in, in the absence of these modules, there's no humanity. Mm -hmm. When you when you miss when you don't have emotional affective empathy, when you don't have access to positive emotions like love, mm -hmm. when you have no sense of self because the formation of yourself has been disrupted in early childhood, when you are callous and ruthless to the point that you objectify people, reduce them to props in your theater play, and so on and so forth. When you put all these together, what's left is not a human being. What's left is a great simulation of a human being. Mm -hmm. And indeed, as, as you mentioned in our correspondence, there was this roboticist, Masahiro Mori in Japan, who suggested uh, presciently, uh, prophetically suggested in 1970 that the more computer, the more robots come to resemble human beings, the less comfortable we're going to feel around them. This is known as the uncanny valley. That's what narcissists and psychopaths do. They imitate, they, they, they imitate, mm -hmm. they simulate human beings, but they're not. Now that's very helpful because the only way we judge the humanity or lack thereof of another person is via language. We rely on self-reporting. Mm -hmm. I have no way to prove that you are a human being. No way whatsoever. I have to rely on your self-reporting. If you're telling me you're sad, I have no machine or device or test or probe that can prove that you're sad. I have to rely on your self-reporting and if, either I trust you or not. In other words, language is a great arbiter. Language is the, the infinite detector of internal states. It's a bad detector in many, many cases because people lie, prevaricate, fantasize, there are major disruptions to the communication of internal states. Mm -hmm. But it's still the only tool we have. Now, AI is vastly superior to human beings mm -hmm. in analyzing language and language patterns. Vastly superior. 
And this is where detection of narcissists and psychopaths could be raised up to the next level. Because psychologists and psychiatrists and other types of clinicians, they are not good at analyzing language. And the reason they're not good at analyzing language is that language triggers in them associations. Mm -hmm. When I talk to you and I would say the word mother, that's not an objective neutral word. The minute I say mother, it triggers in you memories, emotions, pain, love, I don't know what. And these, this is noise. It obscures the signal. This will never happen with an AI program. If I tell the AI program mother, that's it. It's a lexical, there's lexical meaning, there's interconnectivity with other things, and but it's all the time objective and neutral and so there's not the level of noise in ai is much lower when it comes to verbal verbal communication level of noise in ai is much lower than in human beings therefore ai would be better in my view at spotting narcissists and psychopaths so then you're saying we're clinicians and, and people that are diagnosing are getting too much data. So you're saying we need to simplify it. And Not only too much data, but the data triggers noise, ah. triggers emotions, triggers memories, triggers, you know, they're not good machines. Clinicians so then, are not good machines. So then as a follow-up, then how can you differentiate if we're going to use psychopaths, someone that would actually manipulate for their own use versus like confabulation where you would have a narcissist create and fill in all the gaps. So that might be a challenge that machine um, or um, data scientists and actual programmers may have the challenge to understand like, is this real? Is this lies? Or is no. this filling in the hole? No, not really. Because the conviction of the narcissist in the veracity of the fantasy or the confabulation shines through. Mm -hmm. The narcissist, for example, is, is likely, much more likely to use words like belief or I'm convinced or, or true. or So he's likely to use words that uphold the truthfulness of what he's saying. Whereas a psychopath is much more likely to use Machiavellian manipulative words, such as I would like you to, or I want to, or so the, the psychopathy and the narcissism shine through the language. I can read, which is the optimal way, I could read a text and tell you if this text has been written by a narcissist or a psychopath. However, if I were to communicate with a narcissist or a psychopath face to face, even via Zoom, the noise would be much higher and I may, I may get it wrong. And what artificial intelligence does is, excuse me for a minute, will you? Lydia, someone is ringing the bell. Mm. Mm -hmm. What artificial intelligence does is it is exposed to the, to the semiotics, not always to the semantics and never to the noise. The, the, if I tell artificial intelligence, mother, there's no memory, there's no association, there's no pain, there's no love, there's no, nothing. It's just mother. That's a huge advantage. It's a huge advantage. There is actually, there is almost no other way to diagnose narcissists and psychopaths. Clinicians rely on body language, for example. Mm -hmm. But we know that the same body language is common to people with narcissistic style. Um, clinicians rely on um, kind of a displays of callousness and ruthlessness and one-track mindedness as proof of psychopathy. But that's not validated. That's not true. It's very common to even to healthy people under certain circumstances. Only language exposes narcissists and, and psychopaths infallibly. Only language. And there, AI has advantage. Okay. So that's great to know. So I guess the question becomes then, is there, I, I understand you can have narcissistic tendencies and then you can have narcissistic actual like diagnosis. Okay. So we, we need to distinguish the two. Then we also need to look at like the spectrum, if you want, of narcissism, where you can have covert narcissism versus grandiose. And so 
would you feel that there's going to be a difference between having, you know, the different types or flavors or however you want to describe it? Because the mechanisms, you know, the, the core wound is the same, but they're going to present differently. Yes, of course they're going to present different. Essentially, you're talking about rendering AI a kind of personal therapist. Therapists constantly at your fingertips, available to you. So what does a therapist do? Therapist diagnoses, then therapist, therapist provides you with insights, especially insights about yourself. And then a therapist provides you with good techniques and tips and advice on how to behave in order to minimize harm and maximize utility. That's what good therapists do. Artificial intelligence is capable of doing all three, mm -hmm. given sufficient constraints and rigid you know, control yes, and so yes. on. It is capable of doing all three with a pronounced advantage in the diagnosing stage because of its relationship with language, which clinicians don't have. Clinicians may be better in the tips and advice phase because clinicians can empathize, clinicians can, you know, understand, clinicians. Clinicians are human, so this gives them an advantage when when it comes to interacting with victims and telling them how to, for example, recover or how to how to modify behaviors uh, in order to avoid similar situations in the future and so on. So their clinicians would have the advantage. And I think the best solution is a combination of clinician and AI. Mm -hmm. In other words, AI used by a clinician to interact with clients and mm -hmm. patients and so on. AI as a tool, as an instrument at the disposal of a clinician. Yes, each type of narcissist, narcissism presents differently, but again, like everything else in human life, they're all mediated via language. So mm -hmm. for example, the covert narcissist is likely to be passive aggressive. Passive aggression is usually mediated via language or via actions that are kind of sabotaging, intended to sabotage something, undermine something. Mm -hmm. The overt narcissist, the grandiose narcissist is likely to be in your face, much more open about his beliefs about himself, that he is you know, perfect and omniscient and omnipotent and, and so on. And all these, all this can be reduced to a set of algorithms and, and analytic models that would spot the types uh, pretty safely with a very high validity. That's what we are. That's what we are trying to accomplish with psychological tests, essentially, and we keep failing because psychological tests rely on the goodwill of the participants. If you refuse to, uh, to, for example, if you refuse to respond honestly to a psychological test, such as the narcissistic personality inventory or the PCLR, then they're useless. Mm -hmm. They rely critically on honest self-reporting. So they don't analyze language. They analyze content. And that's a common mistake, by the way. There's a common confusion or conflation of content and language. Content is not language. Content is message. Content is signal, but it's not, it's not language. While AI is focused on language, clinicians are focused on message mm -hmm. or content. And narcissists and psychopaths are brilliant at manipulating messaging, manipulating messages and signals. But even they, cannot overcome the inherent limitations and structure of language. Mm. So I wouldn't be too worried about the various presentations of narcissism. They're all reducible to the same set of relatively primitive and well-defined criteria, which is behavioral, but mediated via language. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And so we, we really need to break it down to its root you know, the root of what's being said. And I, that's exactly why I think AI is definitely has an advantage because it breaks it down to the root of 
all the words of the sentiment of understanding what is being said. And so if you are forced to communicate with somebody and you've suggested multiple times, you've got a personality disorder that's stunted in development between the age of three and 11, and we're gonna say 11 is very generous, but they are stunted emotionally. How can one communicate with somebody that is of that developmental, you know, stunted growth? Is it something that, you know, you and I can have a communication and we're aiming for the same goal and it's to understand each other's viewpoint and talk about this. What if it's different? What if it's, you know, manipulation or what if it's other things and you're forced to communicate with them? How does the, the fact that they present at such a young age change how you need to communicate with them? Have you ever communicated with the child? <laughs> All the time. That's it. That's the answer. Children are manipulative. Children are egocentric. Mm -hmm. Children are disempathic. They lack mm -hmm. emotional and I mean, at a certain age, up to a certain age, they lack emotional and affective empathy. Children mm -hmm. are narcissists. Yeah. Even Freud recognized it. He said there's primary narcissism and secondary narcissism. Children, and then later on in life, adolescents, especially early adolescents, they are narcissists. And so everyone who has ever communicated with a child is perfectly equipped to communicate with a narcissist. Mm -hmm. The problem is that unconsciously we make the erroneous assumption that narcissists are adults. Mm -hmm. Even when narcissists attend therapy, the vast majority of clinicians treat them as if they were adults. Mm -hmm. They try to strike a therapeutic alliance with the narcissist. They try to negotiate with the narcissist. They try to compromise with the narcissist. They try to reason with the narcissist. They try to show, demonstrate to the narcissist their insights. They treat the narcissist as an adult. Mm -hmm. Narcissists are not adults. The overwhelming vast majority of narcissists are between the ages of two and three, mentally and psychologically speaking. So people say, but wait a minute, then how would they be capable to run a big company or even a country? You know, it's nothing to do with it. This is nothing. To, psychological mental age has nothing to do with your skills or capacity to, for example, have semantic memory, memory of processes. Mm -hmm. so, narcissists are children who are in charge of countries. They are children who are in charge of corporations. They are children in show business, they are children in law enforcement, but they are mentally children. When they are confronted with situations which do not involve emotions, they are perfectly capable. They have at their disposal all the skills and the, mem and the kind of memory that known as semantic memory, the kind of memory that is very good at you know, doing things, accomplishing things. But whenever they are confronted with emotion, stress, anxiety, tension, crisis, demands, criticism, disagreement. Whenever they're for, confronted with these situations, they regress instantly and become immediately children. They throw temper tantrums. They're incapable of predicting the consequences of their actions. They have no perception of time. They're utterly children. So if you want to communicate with the Nazis efficaciously, simply wrap your mind around the realization that it's a child. It's very difficult to do because they look to be, they look grown-ups, you know, that they, they are children in adult mm -hmm. body. We tend to confuse body, chronological age. Uh, we tend to confuse chronological age with mental age. And so, and that's a huge mistake. And that is the source of the frustration and the hurt and the the prolonged grief of victims mm -hmm. because they have made the assumption that they were assumption that they were dealing with adults and then suddenly a child hurt them and it's difficult to take whenever victims attach to narcissists they attach to the child it's an, it's it's a maternal attachment people of both genders male or female even if you're a male and you see a baby you smile and you coo and you are protective of the baby, yeah? Even men become maternal when they're faced with the baby. So the narcissist triggers in all of us maternal instincts. Mm -hmm. 
then to let go of this child is difficult. It's always difficult to let go of a child. And so maybe we lie to ourselves that this is not a child, this is an adult, in order to avoid the grief and the hurt and the pain later on. But it's not working. It's not working because the narcissist triggers our inner child. It's a child-to-child -child interaction, basically. It's a playmate kind of thing. It's, it's a very complex uh, dynamic. But to your question, the answer is simple beyond, beyond belief. Simply assume that it's a child and proceed accordingly. End of story. You don't need complicated books and therapy sessions and, and interviews. That's it. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the biggest issues is you do have someone that is stuck in grief. So if someone has gotten to the point where they recognize that this is a toxic situation or a relationship and they have, they're dealing with a cognitive dissonance where they can recognize, I love this person because they did X, Y, and Z thing that was good, or they were kind during these times, but then they recognize there's a lot of negativity there is multiple factors. So it's like you're having somebody that needs to deal with those wounds, those core wounds, understanding and, and, and basically healing that aspect. But then if you're forced to communicate with somebody and you're seeing the glimpse of the good, the bad, I think it can prolong the, hear, uh, the healing process. And so having something and if we were to slice it up, if we're just looking at the linguistics aspect of it and say, okay, we're only going to worry about written communication or we're going to worry about that. And we need to just basically separate out because a narcissist is going to want to have that supply. They're going to want to have that safety. They're going to want to drag you back in the hoovering as you coined the term. And so having somebody be able to work with licensed therapists and professional to help them understand the trauma bond, get healthy, but also use a tool to help them separate out from this situation, I think has the potential to really help a lot of people. Anything that puts a mirror to you, mm -hmm. anything that allows you to look at yourself, to see yourself as you are, is always helpful. That's at the mm -hmm. core of therapy. Psychotherapy mm -hmm. is about providing you with insight about yourself that you're incapable of generating on your own. So any instrument, AI instrument, soft, software program. There was a, a software program called ELISA in the 60s. It mm -hmm. did the same. It wasn't artificial intelligence, but it was a, a simulation of a therapist, of a psychotherapist. It's called ELISA. Mm -hmm. It's very successful. To this very day, you could use ELISA. I think it's available online. It's stunning. It's like a therapist. So the the problem with um, the problem with when you team up with a narcissist one way or another, mm -hmm. you interact or you react to the narcissist on so many levels that the, to extricate yourself later on becomes self-sacrificial. It becomes a, a, an act of self-immolation. When you interact with a normal person, even if you fall in love with someone, there's an intimate partner, you have a relationship and so on and so forth, there is a part of you that is preserved in a pristine way. There's a part of you that is untouched by the partner, which is very healthy, very good. There's a part of you that is that remains you, never mind what happens to the partner and what happens to the relationship. It's not the case with narcissists. With narcissists as a takeover, and it's not always a hostile takeover. Mm -hmm. The narcissist truly believes in the shared fantasy. He truly believes that he loves you. He truly believes in these promises to you. He truly wants this to work. He believes that you are enabling him to experience, for example, love. Or, you know, so he's euphoric. Throughout this, he's euphoric. This is known as narcissistic elation. It's an oceanic feeling. And you respond in kind. You react to the narcissist as a mother, the maternal part. You react to the narcissist as the realization of all your dreams, your dreams, your dream come true. You react to the narcissist because of the fantasy. 
The fantasy is, is an escape from reality, which is very tempting in today's world. You react to the narcissist as the one, finally found your soulmate or your twin flame, whatever you want to call it, yeah. your compliment, you know. Everything in you responds to the narcissist and every single part of you interacts with every single part of the narcissist. Ultimately, you find yourself enmeshed. Mm -hmm. You find that you have become a single organism with the narcissist. So to let go of the narcissist is to let go of you, is to self-amputate. It's, it's extremely painful. The grief is multifaceted. You grieve for the narcissist, of course. When you, when you separate, when you break up, you grieve the narcissist, loss of the narcissist. You grieve the loss of the fantasy. You grieve the loss of, of yourself because you're no longer you. You grieve the loss of the child as a mother. What could be worse? You've just lost your child. You grieve the loss of a parent because the narcissist plays, plays the role of a parent in the, in the relationship as well. This is the dual mothership thing. And so all these layers of grief interact, re inf reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. There's an amplification of grief, magnification of grief. And the worst part is this. Following the breakup, your grief is the only thing that makes sense of your life. Your grief is the only thing that imbues your life with meaning, gives you a reason to, to survive even. Because the alternative is self-annihilating. When you are immersed in grief, you're busy doing something. It keeps you alive. Hmm. And so grief becomes professional. It becomes um, a vocation and an avocation. And that's why you see online millions of victims mourning and grieving for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I'm kidding you not. They can't stop. They can't stop this. Victimhood have, has become their identity, mm -hmm. and it's it's kind of identity politics. If you, they become they have become professional victims. It it also caters to some extent to grandiosity and so. On, but we we'll leave that aside. Also, don't forget that as long as you grieve the narcissist, he's somehow in your life. It's a way to stay in touch with the, with the representation of the narcissist in your mind. It's like he's never gone away. He's, you've never lost him because you're still grieving for him. He still occupies your mind in a way. There's